it's great to be here today. I will be walking through the very colorful history that our industry has, and hopefully uh, by the end of the speak, all of you who are still here, stop saying that uh, our industry would be young, because I have few few things to prove that. Uh, it's, it's the start of a new decade, and the biggest newspaper in my country, Finland, uh, just announced, uh, like, recapped the decade and said that finally video games uh, became the eighth art form. And in many ways, this this uh, presentation is my mi like middle finger to that journalist writing that because I think we've always been one of the great arts. Uh, before I go into the topic itself, uh, uh, my brief presentation. Uh, I've, I'm Jussi Audio. I've been in game business for 14 years, mostly as a designer. Or, or a business developer. Uh, why I'm talking about history of games is also explained that uh, my background is in history. I studied history at the Oulu University. But before I go uh, into the main topics, I want to pinpoint something that usually journalists, artists, movie makers, uh, novelists, they think that uh, we share a common heritage, that everything started when Stone Age people were exchanging stories in, at the fireplace, telling uh, awesome stories. That's not really the case, because our origin is a lot further. It goes to play. Uh, already animals play, and a hundred years ago, Johann Huizinga, a Dutch historian, went into lengths to prove that without the play element, there can't be any other forms of culture. Now, I'm not going to uh, bore you with philosophy, so when did first games appear? Uh, all of the hunters and gatherers that existed in historical time, meaning that someone was watching them, they had games. So can we speculate that games are as old as humanity? Well, sadly, the uh, his history research doesn't really work that way because with the, uh, with the hunters and gatherers, there is few problems that uh, makes us not know so much about, about them. First of all, there's a lot of time going on. And that, of course, influences uh, what we can discover. The lifestyle of hunters and gatherers, they change place, so it's less probable that we will ever find stuff about that have survived than, than with farmers. And of course, uh, most used materials, even though it's called the Stone Age, wood was the most common, or bones, and they decompose quite, quite quickly. So, indeed, if we look at the birth of gaming, uh, we are talking about the birth of farming. There is lots of more evidence, and indeed, wherever high cultures have risen, we instantly see games, games there as well. Let's take two examples. Egypt, no surprise there that Egypt has the oldest oldest game out there. It's called Senet. It's been played uh, at least five and a half thousand years. Uh, but it could be older because Senet style boards have been found in pre-dynastic Egypt. Uh, not the components, just the boards. So it could be that Senet is 8,000 years old, up, well, up to 8,000 years old, old. So it could be older than even ancient Egypt. Uh, the rules themselves are very similar to trouble with the bong bong of the dice, except that the Senate is a lot more tactical. You can impact the game a lot better. So that's, that tells something about Senate that uh, it was played longer, longer duration than Christianity has existed. Uh, and it started out as a secular game, but uh, when co conquerors conquered uh, Egypt, then there was a look back, so it became a religious, religious game later on. Now how about at the other part of the world? Ancient China. Ancient China, uh, or China as we know it, is basically founded during an era called Warring States uh, period, when China was divided into lots of uh, different uh, uh, rival, rival uh, small kingdoms. And it's, it was the golden age of Chinese philosophy. It was the home to Confucius, Mohi, Lao Tzu, and many, many, many others. And by the time that Confucius was just a little toddler, there wasn't just one game, but there were actually three games in the vogue. Liubo, 
has lots of interesting stories about it. Xiangxi was used by the generals already, a Chinese chess variant. And then Wei Qi was one of the four refined arts already during the time of Confucius. Meaning that if you wanted to be anyone, you needed to know how to play Wei Qi. And Wei Qi actually is the oldest game that's still played. Because we know it better by the Japanese name uh, of Go. Now, I, don't, I have limited time, so I don't go to other high cultures, but from, from Ethiopia to Mesoamerica, from India to, to the Andes, all high cultures have had games. Uh, and in, interestingly enough, Ethiopian origin games called Mankala, well, we Euro, European call, call it uh, Mankala, but that's actually a game genre with uh, over 800 historical variants. And that, that game could be older older than humanity. Uh, it's actually so common that it's in the classical research of games, it's one of the five genres of games, where others are war games, racing games, uh, hunt games, and then games of alignment, and indeed then Vankala games. And then, quite surprisingly, the oldest genre listing of games comes from the great enlightened himself, the great Buddha, who lists 16 different game and play categories. Uh, and sadly, uh, well, not, not all of them are games, some are clearly plays. But sadly, the oldest genre listing is a blacklist. Uh, so that's the uh, genre listing of games that Buddha would not play. So. Uh, Thanks, thanks, Buddha, for, for the oldest list. But uh, if you're a good Buddhist, you don't play Pictionary, because that's clearly banned, a banned game, uh, one of the genre listings. Uh, one of the key points that I still want to make is that whenever new technology has risen, games are among the first to, to adopt that, whether it's computers or paper. So when playing cards arrive to Europe, the invention of paper is very, very new. Playing cards come from China, through Ottoman Empire to, to, to Europe, and they take Europe by storm. And interestingly, that history is very well documented. Why? Because uh, there is lots of town ordinances around Europe where games are being banned. So the oldest known, known such ban is in, from Paris, where 1369, they don't ban, they ban lots and lots of different types of games, but not yet card games, and in 1377, also card games are banned, or playing cards are banned. Same happens in Switzerland, same happens in Florence, yes, again, it's a ban. And in Regensburg in 1378, their playing cards is banned if you play at too high stakes, though. And the greatest persecution of games takes place in Nuremberg, which is famous for its trials, because in 1452, there is 76 sledges full of board games, card games, and every, every games available uh, that are being burned at the stake. Now, best to describe how fast games take over Europe is that in only 150 years, over 400 games are invented using playing cards. And these are listed in a, a royal book written for I don't remember, was it for French king or British king, but, uh, but uh, for, for a king who was interested in, in games. Uh, it's not always bad stuff, though, with, uh, with games, or that we know history of games. In Renaissance era Siena, Siena was a democracy, and there was a widespread parlor game uh, culture, which allowed women to compete mentally uh, as equals with men. And over the course of slightly more than 100 years. First, the men were super impressed. And in, in one academy, they started making plays that promoted the role of women. And sooner or later, it led to first letting women into the academy, which caused a huge, huge uh, uh, scandal, of course. So Florence, who had conquered Siena, banned that. But then later on, uh, first in the world, there was an academy directly uh, aimed for women, Academy of the Assicurate, focusing on, on poetry and uh, plays. Now, educational games have been around forever as well, so nothing new with the serious games uh, topics. Uh, 
you could say that the 18th, 18, oh, sorry, 19th century is the year, uh, century of Tacticis Kriegspiel, uh, because it was used by militaries around the Western world. The Tacticis Kriegspiel is the first war simulation game, not like tactical game like chess, but rather that there is two players and an umpire who basically is the computer, who has the only board with all the information, and then the players just give orders like they would uh, if they were on a battlefield. And it played a small role in the Napoleonic Wars, but then they pl the game pl played a huge role in the German Unification War, when Germans uh, beat down Dan Danish, Austrians, and France. The Prussian military uh, commanders gave thanks to the Tacticis Kriegspiel, which led to the adoption of the of the game in the other uh, countries as well. Now, interesting historical curiosi curiosities are that the Schlieffen Plan in the First World War was devised by using Tacticis Kriegspiel, and so was the British, uh, British response. They also simulated that and changed their plans because they realized that if Germans attack through Belgium and Netherlands, Brits can't come, uh, uh, come on time to help, so they changed their plans where they would land with the, with the uh, Expeditionary, expeditionary uh, troops, difficult word, sorry. And indeed, Pearl Harbor was uh, simulated by the Japanese. And actually, the first couple of uh, simulations, they ended in a disaster. So they also revised their plan and managed to make a surprise attack on the American base. And not so important role, but small role tactics uh, Kriegspiel had also in Second World War. Because when D-Day took place, there was a bad weather, and then both military commanders of the German army were off. One was vid visiting a family, and the other had went to a place without a phone, playing or simulating the oncoming uh, attack on the beaches of Normandy. So he wasn't there and couldn't be reached. In, I think it's 36 hours or something, because they didn't expect uh, that attack during the bad weather. Now, one more point that I want to make, why, why, <coughs> sorry, why we shouldn't call our industry young, is re regard to business models. Now, let's have a look at the pin games, or pinball games. So, Bacatelle, one of the earliest pinball games was already really popular in the 1700s. Actually, uh, it was uh, played a lot by the Sun King, Louis XIV also. Uh, and first attempts to make money by coin-operated uh, things was to sell seditious material in 1822, so that you could sell porn, basically, without knowing that it's you selling that, but that was not successful. The first successful adaptation for Coin-operated mechanisms came from arcades, pinball games, basically. Uh, so by the time of <coughs> late eight, 800s, uh, there were lots of amusement games, pinball games, and others where you just insert the coin and then you get, get to have some fun. And they spread, uh, spread to bars so that the bars could make money uh, by selling also entertainment for the customers. Now, I'm not going to, to uh, I'm not going too deep into the uh, video game history, but this is exactly the distribution uh, model that the video games needed half a century later. So there was a way to distribute video games or arcades. And interestingly enough, uh, it was the Great Depression actually that helped pinball games spread everywhere because they were cheap to manufacture, cheap to, uh, uh, cheap to play, and they didn't break down. So that's why pinball games became the big, big thing. Now, I think I'm running out of time, so it's time to wrap things up. So my point is that games have been around forever, and we will be around forever. Uh, games are older than movies, Games are older than novels. Games are older than theater. So we should stop saying that our industry is young. And indeed, by the time our industry, video game industry, is born, there is already, uh, there is already distribution model, models in place. There is already uh, monetization models beyond just the premium in place. And it's 
just a continuum in a fact that whenever new, it, new inventions take place, whether it's bones, paper, coin-operated mechanisms, or computers, games are among the first to adapt it. So that's pretty much it. I think I'm out of no, no, time. You, you've, got, you've got a few more minutes, so um, I think the timer there's a little ahead. But, ah, okay. Uh, well, then, if then... If you want to carry on, feel free. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Well, indeed, then it's only the last point, that by the time video games were born, we had already t game TV shows. Uh, in America, and, and I think in Britain, people had watched people play Spelling Bee on television before our video games were even invented. So, let's stop saying that our industry is young and take pride in the colorful history that we all share. So, if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer. And also, I have 11 hour lecture series in Udemy, which is now on discount. So, if you want to learn more, use this code and you'll get it uh, at 80% discount. Ooh, Thanks. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any particular questions, or should I kick off as always? Uh, so I'm going I'm to kick off. So I'm, I love the fact that you kind of, if you think back through it, like you said earlier, that games are actually older than humans, and particularly or play at least. Yes, is older indeed. Than humans. Like what? What else yeah. is uh, uh, games than plays with rules? Exactly. Yeah. But even in, uh, I think, they, haven't they done studies of, I think, chimp play? And they, there seems to be an established kind of set up of social rules, if, yeah, if nothing yeah, else. Exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, what, so what do you think that says to us in terms of, you know, how we look at new, in designing new games? Is, you know, are there lessons from looking at the kind of primeval kind of way of looking at play that we should still be paying attention to, you know, in, in creating, you know, for example, is hyper-casual just another, you know, who gets the fruit? Yeah, yeah, I mean, <coughs> I'm, I'm definitely pro into that. If we look at lots of the big classics of the 19th century, or 20, oh, sorry, 20th century, they usually have some sort of root in, in some of the historical games. Like Senate was played for thousands of years, and then Trouble uh, is almost identical, except that you can't protect your pieces like you can in Senate. Uh, which basically takes away the player influence uh, quite, a, quite a bit. Same, same indeed, Buddha told us not to play Pictionary. Uh, clearly one of the genre is that you shouldn't play games where one draws a picture and the other one tries to guess uh, what that is. So I'd so like to know why. <laughs> why is Pictionary so evil? <laughs> then again, if you've played it over Christmas, you probably know. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe it's just my, my family. <laughs> Any other questions? On that note, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for thank having you. me.